team of hotel brokers based in Fort Lauderdale with, with agents also in Greenville, South Carolina, and Philadelphia. And our model is different than most of our competitors inside Marcus and, and externally, and that we're not as limited by our location. Uh, we prioritize 17 states in the Southeast and, and East Coast and Midwest, and currently our assignments are somewhere between two and 40 million. And I, I'm, hopefully that broad range and geography and product focus gives us a unique feel for the market in its entirety. And as you imagine, the uh, day-to-day of a broker has changed drastically during COVID. Um, each of us still having, you know, 60 to seven conversations a week, but instead of marketing and prospecting, the emphasis has been on checking on people, you know, comparing notes and, uh, also relaying what we learned from the collective comparisons, uh, of conversations and just general exposure to the market. So through all those conversations and, and sorting through everything that we've dealt with the last few months, uh, and working with a really diverse group of owners, a few consistent areas of, of interest or uncertainty have emerged. And that became the motivation for this uh, presentation. So we're hoping to sufficiently address them. Um, I know there's a lot of webinars uh, floating around right now. We wanted to avoid a presentation that summarized data to show how bad things have been or, or you know, even feature someone attempting to project what the next you know, three or four years is going to look like. So hopefully here uh, each of you will get something out of it. Through all this, this COVID and the, the different conversation, I personally realized I underestimated the number of owners who have at least one securitized hotel loan. The vast majority of those owners uh, that I've spoken with have expressed some degree of uncertainty about the best way to manage those loans um, through the current climate. And that brings me to our first guest. Uh, Ann Hambly is the founder and CEO of First Service Solutions and is understood to be one of the premier CMBS resolution specialists in the country. And she's resolved in excess of $25 billion in securitized loans, and uh, that number will undoubtedly inflate after 2020. So I've referred clients to her and, and know many owners have hired her independently, and this is the fourth of her presentations I've been able to hear. Uh, so, Ann, we appreciate you you being here, and I'll, I'll go on and turn it over to you. Thank you. Appreciate that, Robert. And just know real quickly that I've spent 35 years of my career in and running servicing shops. Um, very heavy in CMBS from day one and have had my firm for 15 years now. And all we do is help owners with CMBS debt. We happen to be very, uh, uh, very much in demand right now with all of everyone needing some relief on their CMBS loan. So first of all, on page three of the slides is just, I think most of you would know this already, but the difference in uh, CMBS versus bank loans, and it's very pronounced right now during this, this coronavirus pandemic, if a, a owner has, you know, two loans, one's CMBS, one's not, I've heard over and over they can pick up the phone and call their banker. I've even heard such nice stories as bankers calling borrowers and saying, don't worry about your next few payments, we'll work with you. Whereas in CMBS, that banker's gone and there is almost feels like no one to talk to. And, and so we'll talk about that. But that's the stark difference. Um I won't go through uh, page four is a CMBS structure and it looks complicated and most of you will tune me out right now, but just know that a bunch of owners that loans are pooled together for uh, bonds are then issued and bonds are, you know, triple A down to unrated. The unrated bond holders appoint a special servicer and there, and those unrated bond holders are really all opportunistic High yielding funds, and they wind up controlling the entire CMBS industry. And there are about 10 of them in the industry controlling everything. So, the important thing to know is not who is your master servicer, not necessarily who's your special servicer, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the ones pulling the, you know, the control levers are the controlling class representatives or the lowest rated bondholder in a pool. Um, the number five is I go through the uh, CMBS loans. The reason there's no banker and the important thing to know about CMBS is they those uh, the CMBS structure is is in an IRS vehicle and the IRS vehicle that these loans are put into and, and I think personally they're kind of shoved in there. They, they don't really fit, but they're shoved in there. It's called a REMIC, a real estate mortgage investment conduit. And the reason that's important, and you're probably all thinking, why do I care about that? But it will speak to the heart of what's going on here now. Um, the whole point with the REMIC is for every dollar the borrower pays into the servicer, 
that whole dollar needs to go out to bondholders. There, there cannot be a taxation at the entity level or a, a CMBS product would never work. So the ultimate goal of servicers is to make sure they're always keeping the REMIC uh, tax laws in mind. And one of the worst things a servicer can do uh, in a REMIC status is to modify a performing loan. So if you've got a performing loan, coronavirus hits, you're asking for relief, in essence, you, ha- you the servicer stands the chance of making, you know, doing something wrong here and making the entire pool of bonds um, taxed. So understand where the servicers are coming from and, and understand that they, they're highly restrictive on what they can do. Now, special servicers, different story, but the master servicers are always keeping this in mind. And, and this is what drives all of the servicers' decisions. Okay, so now let's talk about COVID-19, and I'm going to focus this, um, you know, all on hospitality. And, and hospitality, of course, is the product that um, went off a, a cliff, right? So COVID-19 hit and closures started happening in the middle of March, and we started having panicked owners calling um, immediately, uh, inquiring about what to do with, should I make the payment in April? Um, what, what do I do? There's so many, uh, you know, concerns. So hospitality, of course, was hit the first, the hardest. You guys all know that yourself. Um, and so they're the ones kind of leading the whole charge for COVID relief. So the approval process, and I got a little little diagram here on page seven, but um, the master servicers, while a loan is in master servicing, they're governed again by this REMIC, these REMIC rules. So they're very, very, very restricted on what they can do. A master servicer so far has gotten comfortable with granting um, a 90-day or three-month payment deferral, and that's about all they can grant. Anything beyond the three months does require uh, the approval of the special servicer. And a special servicer, you can only get to a special servicer one of two ways. One way is you have to have missed 60 days of payments or two payments. So if you stop and think about when COVID-19 hit, middle of March, I had a number of, in fact, 20% of hotel owners that had CMBS debt did not make their payment for April, and about over 50% did not for May. So those that did not make the April payment, they're going to be 60 days delinquent come, coming up on their June payment. Those loans are in the process of being transferred to the special servicer, and that's where you have to be to get the real relief. Now, the only other way you can get to special servicing other than missing two payments is with the, I'm going to call it a threat or declaration of an imminent default, meaning I'm not in default yet, I didn't miss a payment yet, but I'm not going to continue to fund the shortfall absent some relief from you. So I'm I'm telling you Although I'm not in default today, I will be in default. And um, so an imminent default is the other way you can get to special servicing. Now, uh, the next page is visual in nature. And here's what it looks like as you're trying to get to the special servicer. Um, Hopefully you see on your screen a whole bunch of traffic. And what it's like is you've got five special servicers who control, you know, 90% of CMBS. And you've got probably, I don't know the number exactly, but you've probably got 10,000 at least borrowers trying to get in to see them. So there is a long wait, and that's why they're waiting for the 60 days delinquency to get you in there. But it's a long wait. It's frustrating. If you're an owner and you have no income coming in on your hotel, and and you need help, there's nothing more frustrating today that we're hearing about than the length of time it takes to even get someone to call you back. So uh, that that's that's the downside in it. Okay, so the, I've got a couple of things I want to cover now. The process up on the right, you'll see it, we already talked about, but the master servicers cannot grant the relief. It can only give you this three-month deferral of payments. Special servicers are what it takes to get the relief. 
and you got to be 60 days delinquent or, you know, imminently in danger of going into default. The most common relief granted so far is the one that you can get while you're in master servicing. No surprise, because that's the first stop along the way in the road. And what they can grant, again, is three months of deferral. You have to pay it back over the course of a year, typically in 2021. The fees, I put in here reasonable fees. What we're seeing, I'll verbally tell you, is about 10000 for the approval. It's not always consistently that, but they're but they're generally reasonable. And you can get waiver of uh, triggers and covenants. So, you know, these loan documents have all kinds of uh, debt service coverage triggers. And um, the worst thing that could happen, I think, in my opinion, would be that an owner come out of pocket, keep the loan current, not ask for relief. And come June 30th, they send in their quarterly financials, and they're going to be now in a cash sweep because they'll have triggered all of the bad things you can in your documents. And it takes, you know, six months of, um, of, of, not, of, of recovery in order to get out of that. So it's, it's uh, not somewhere that you want to be. Um, so you want a waiver of those triggers and covenants. Um, everyone asks about the government relief. What's available? Um, what can help the CMBS owner? And unfortunately, there is no uh, government relief right now that you can utilize uh, as an or that you can take advantage of as an owner with CMBS debt. Um, one of the things that's out there is, of course, the PPP, and the PPP. Um, is getting approved by the servicers across the board, but it does require approval. If you don't get the approval from the servicer, and and this ultimately is not a grant, you know, it, it, you don't use it uh, in accordance with the regulations to make it a grant, then actually you're violating potentially your recourse carve outs here by adding debt. So PPP, you got to get approval. The, the EIDL loans, um, all the SBA loans, anything with a loan name in its, in its description is being denied across the board. And then there's, of course, this Main Street program that's available or coming out, and that will give a borrower 12 months of debt service for, I think, a two-year, 2% 2 interest rate. Um, I, I don't know if that's widely available. I've not had anyone ask me for approval to do that. But... So government relief is pretty much non-existent for uh, hotel owners other than the PPP, which you do have to get approval for. Um, other things that uh, I wanted to cover with you is on the last page, and then I'm, my presentation is done, and I'm happy to entertain questions or do whatever you'd like, Robert, but um, fees. So again, we talked about the reasonable fees that I think are being charged for the three-month payment deferral. The fees for anything other than that, where you have to go to special servicer and you need longer period of time, those are not standard yet. We're getting uh, feedback across the board um, and know that those are negotiable. So it's not like you have to go in with your eyes closed and get hit over the head with a hammer and it is what it is. They'll offer you fees and, and you'll be, you have to negotiate the fees. So there's nothing standard there. Um, let me tell you why some of the very first uh, responses we heard when we're asking for the COVID relief was um, various versions. I, I jokingly told some people in my group that I think that some of the servicers created a drop-down menu to respond to borrowers. And it was the drop-down menu was no, you know, I, I use various versions of this, but, you know, definitely no, and of course not ever, ever, you know. So all the responses we were getting were various forms of denials to begin with, and the denials were because of the, one of the three reasons. Um, either the borrower took a lot of money out when they refinanced the loan in 1995, <laughs> long time ago, um, or uh, the sponsor uh, or guarantor has a lot of money, uh, their, their net worth is really high, so they don't need my relief, or the third one was property performed really well now, last year, so why should I give you relief now? And, of course, none of those things matter in these loans, and that shouldn't matter right now during this COVID crisis. Um, you could kind of get past these, but the, the denial was meant, in my personal opinion, as a form of trying to 
push people away and have you try to figure out the solution as an owner on your own. Suck it up is what I kind of, all the themes were, suck it up, you go figure it out, owner, don't come to me. Well, they were successful. Some owners said, okay, I'll go figure it out other ways. That's what they want. And then others, we say, look, we can't, right? We need your help. And then you continue the discussion. Question I get asked over and over and over, should I make the payment? So I got a closed hotel, let's say, um, you know, and I have no income coming in. It, do I need to make the payment? Um, on, a, on a webinar, if I had a one-off client call, I have an answer. On a webinar here, I'm going to be a little more careful. But it, your outcome and your end result is not different than anything I've seen, um, whether you come out of pocket and keep the payments current or you don't. Now, again, if you're looking for merely the three-month of deferral of the payments, then by all means, you should probably keep the loan current and get that relief and move on with, you know, with life. If you need more than three months, you're going to get the special servicer anyway. Remember, there's only two ways to get there. One is an actual default and one is an imminent default. So it doesn't necessarily do you well, do, do a borrower good to come out of pocket and make those payments. With everything Ann said and everything she's working with to, to help her clients, there's there's a lot of just general fatigue associated with securitized debt and really debt in general and a lot of uncertainty that goes with it. Um, and, and as I mentioned, just all our conversations and what we're hearing have noticed more owners sort of you know, having to scrutinize you know the approach, their future approach for, for a refinance, for a looming loan maturity, or, or eventually you know, how they'll fund their next acquisition, basically considering options. and um, with that as a segue, I'll introduce Robert Bott, who's Robert's consistently one of the top loan originators nationally, the top 10 at Marcus Millage Capital Corporation, and a large percent of, of Robert's business is hospitality. He sourced in excess of $2 billion in commercial debt, and is currently the number one producer of any type in the state of Florida for Marcus. So, Robert, thanks for being here uh, to relay some insight thanks, in the capital markets and, and uh, take it away segue from Ann's presentation. By the way, Ann, that was a great presentation um, on on the servicing. I'm getting a lot of clients that are contacting me about CMBS loans, and, and a lot of them are having servicing issues. Um, and I actually have done a lot of CMBS loans last year for hotels. Um, but another point um, that she did mention that I just want to hone in on a little bit is that, you know, we have to be careful when we're requesting the forbearance um, to not cross into the cash management triggers, because once you go into the cash management, um, it, it's it really can be a pain, and and um, you know it's it's something that it's going to be hard to get out of, and you don't want to get in there unless you know you, there's a dire need. So you have to weigh those. You have to weigh the loan amount, if whether it's worth it. Look at the loan size. There's four main ways to get hotels financed. Um, and you know we could start with CMBS. No, no surprise that CMBS is on pause. Um, they were on pause for all product types, but recently um, they did open up for pretty much everything except hotels. Um, last year, about thirty percent of hotel volume uh, came from CMBS, and CMBS is the primary non-recourse uh, lending arm for for hotels. So um, you know when you start talking about twenty, thirty million dollar hotels and small funds, a lot of them kind of depend on CMBS. So um, it does take away a lot of liquidity out of the market. Uh, it's not sure, it's not certain when they'll open back up. Uh, right now, there's about $9 billion in um, CMBS loans that are waiting to securitize. So these loans have already been funded by the lenders. Uh, whenever the pandemic started, the securitization stopped, and there's about $9 billion that are waiting to be funded. Um, now they are signing up deals, but you know, for like some retail, mostly multifamily, industrial. Um, the next one is the SBA and five hundred four. Uh, for the SBA seven A, that is that is the only option right now for getting hotels financed today. Uh, I guess the only option that's readily available, and most of the national SBA lenders have told me that they're on pause. So if you are looking for an SBA loan, it's something where you would have to go out to that market and market to a lot of the local banks that are going to do the SBA 7A. The 504 loans 
we're not there yet. Just because a lot of the, the commercial banks, which are on pause, I'll talk about next. A lot of the commercial banks, um, they take about fifty to sixty percent of the um, the ownership to each loan. So. 504 is not there, but I will say that once you start to see a lot of these commercial banks doing 504 loans, that is when I believe is is kind of a segue for the conventional financing. Because once lenders start getting comfortable with with taking some exposure on these 504 loans uh, in, in a widely marketed basis, then we're going to start to see a lot of the conventional financing open up. Um, right now, I had not seen that. Uh, there are specific deals that do get financed and, and they can get done. There are some hotels right now that are occupying, you know, 40, 50 percent of rooms. So those specific properties are are a little bit easier. Um, and we're going to talk about potential candidates for uh, for financing in a second. The next financing arm would be bridge lenders and funds in general. Uh, bridge lenders, I would say maybe 40% have stopped lending or on pause, or they're having funding issues themselves. With the remaining 60%, um, they are lending, but they're lending with lower LTVs and higher rates. So there's nothing worse than having a bridge lender that has even higher rates and a lower LTV. You really only use these bridge lenders during a time like this when you need to. Um, so. I'm not doing that many bridge loans, but some of them do get done. Uh, they are out there, and uh, they're they're. I mean, they're looking for hotel deals. They'll tell you, but their rates are going to be high. With you know nine, ten, eleven percent rate, two uh, percent um, on the on the origination fees, and they're going to have a lot of structure to it. Lower LTV is in you know sixty percent, maybe you know in the fifties. It just depends. Uh, the commercial banks we kind of talked about commercial bank financing is on pause. The nationwide banks. I would say are the most conservative in terms of everything: multi-tenant retail, single-tenant retail, even some multifamily. Um, but nationwide banks have pulled back, uh, you know, tremendously. The local banks is where a lot of this financing is taking place. I've got some recently closed deals that we're going to discuss. We can go to the next slide timeline for increased lender appetite. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but. Um, in order for the appetite to to get better with lenders, no surprise, uh, we're going to need something to happen. Not all of these options have to happen. But we're going to need, you know, obviously a vaccine, but that's not going to happen for you know for some time. But we're going to need nationwide occupancy to to improve uh, convention center business to pick up um, new cases to drop. A lot of these things have to happen uh, with the convention centers. There's a lot of hotels that uh, most of their revenues come from convention centers, so. Um, we can actually already go to the next slide. This kind of goes into the underwriting factors for for new loans. Um, you know, they're going to look a lot of these lenders when hotel financing does open back up. They're going to look to uh, concentration risk, diversification amongst revenue stream. Um, they're going to look to, um, I guess, concentration to a park or a destination like Orlando. I'll tell you, Fannie Mae uh, two days ago just flagged Orlando as a pre-review city. So any deal that happens with Fannie Mae, it it auto, you know, it gets delegated at 65% LTV versus 75. Now we can still get 75, but it just goes to show you that, you know, Fann, even Fannie Mae is pulling back in certain cities. Um the borrower background, I think when lenders are going to start underwriting on this is going to be even more important. They're going to look to your portfolio and try to examine are, are there any big cash flow drains that they have to worry about. So just be mindful when when showing them that uh, the borrower experience. They're going to look for good liquidity. Um, you know, in some cases, I think with a borrower experience, they might like this. You know, a buyer or someone that's refinancing that you know is maybe a doctor or a lawyer or something that only has one or two hotels um, that's looking to to do something. At the same time, they also are looking for someone that's experienced that doesn't have a lot of exposure. So I would say that it, it could go both ways with the borrower background. Um, historical performance, I think you, when if you're planning on selling or you're planning on refinancing, uh, you, you, you know you have to be careful about how you report this 2019 tax return. I know everyone wants to get a refund, um, but you know reporting a massive loss 
and deducting, you know, over deducting expenses, we have to be a little bit mindful because everyone is going to put so much importance on that 2019 tax return. Uh, they're going to use that, that as a basis of your best case scenario for normalized returns. And they're going to apply a, a cushion on it. So they're going to say a 2019 revenue or 2019 income was this. We'll take 75 or 50 percent of it. So just be be mindful as you're doing your 2019 returns if they're already done or if you're if you're planning on on, on turning them in. Um, pandemic insurance. Uh, a few lenders have mentioned this, but you know I'm not sure how much traction this will gain. I hope not a lot, but um, you know I can imagine how expensive it'll be. But it's just something for us to pay attention to that. I could see a CMBS shop or, um, you know, when everything starts getting bad, I, I could see a national bank saying, oh, well, we'll do hotels, but you have to have pandemic insurance. When, you know, when a vaccine comes out, there, you know, I could I could see a lot of lenders saying, what what happens if this happens again? Um, even though we know it's something that happens once in a century, but, you know, a lot of lenders are going to have difficulty accepting that. So something for you to pay attention to. Um, as we go through this, now that we're we're in the market in general, there's there's really undeniable evidence of, of the beginnings of a recovery. Whether it's you know, hotel occupancy increasing 7.64 percent per week uh, in the weeks between early April and, and then Memorial Day spike, or TSA traffic as a percentage of the same period in, in 19 growing on average 23.14 percent per week uh, since early April. There there we're in a recovery, and, and through that and our conversations. Uh, there's been a noticeable shift in focus for a lot of owners, a uh, single asset and portfolio uh, to target property level break even. And it's just become a reality. And it's become a focal point. And with that, um, there's a lot of thought and, and consideration maybe hadn't happened in the past to, to how to mitigate carrying costs or, or find a bottom line. And over the years, generally, I've been surprised at the relative lack of scrutiny of the cost and extent of hotel insurance, uh, which I think going forward, everything's scrutinized and that'll change with it. So partially for that reason, I've, I've asked Richard Chang to join um, and shed light on what's happening with, with hotel insurance. And maybe more importantly, uh, he can suggest ways for, for anyone listening to identify and avoid additional liability that could emerge from COVID. Um, Richard and his team specialize in hospitality insurance and, and have been a reliable outlet for our team's referrals over the years. And he, he represents all A-rated hotel carriers and um, his agency insures well over a thousand hotels. So, Richard, we we appreciate your time and knowledge, and take it away. Hey, gentlemen, thank you, Robert. All right, uh, we're going to talk first about the negligence uh, possible results of the uh, pandemic, and we want to uh, really emphasize and, and prevention uh, prevention measures uh, such as following the local CDC cleaning guidelines. And if you're a franchise risk, uh, you can follow your franchise guidelines. Uh, they they've been pretty good about providing uh, ways to mitigate and prevent uh, potential uh, suits due to the, the pandemic exposure. Um, another thing is that you definitely want to, uh, re if you're ordered to close due to civil authority, you definitely want to hear that as one of the main key factors that uh, a lot of risk managers advise. Uh, especially I talked to IHG and the choice uh, representatives, and that's, that's the one thing they they emphasize against is opening against any type of government orders that opens doors for, for, for potential suits. Uh, not only do you want to protect against your guests, you want to definitely protect your employees uh, during these times. Um, a lot of ways that, that employers are protect against employees is potentially providing the, the, the resources and knowledge uh, such as gloves, masks, et cetera, the, the usual items. But uh, one thing, the product liability we're going to touch on is, again, it's back to prevention. And the hotel product, obviously, is the room rentals. Uh, with that being said, some hotels are limited service and provide breakfast items. And one way that the hotel years have been doing that is allowing guests to take the breakfast or bag breakfast to the room uh, to further prevent the spread. Uh, obviously, if you have a breakfast buffet, it is definitely not a good time to have one. Uh, the full-service restaurants, unfortunately, uh, in our area have been closed or limited to only 25% to 50% occupancy. And that may be the same for the hotel restaurant, depending on which county and obviously which state. So with that going forward, we, we definitely want to be careful of that. Uh, discrimination, uh, we're going to touch on that briefly. Is, is the likelihood uh, hoteliers have been asking me questions about how do we refuse service that we think guests that have it or how, how do we go approach this? Um, 
And one thing to protect the hoteliers going forward is the, the right to protect uh, and their employees and the, the livelihood of others. But with that being said, there, there's some signage allowed to put on the hotel entrances, uh, such as if you have symptoms, et cetera, et cetera, uh, please refrain from coming in. Um, one hotel uh, group has asked if, if they're allowed to take temperatures. And, and then that, that's a tough, touchy subject. And, and obviously, I, I don't know how to answer that. So until if I hear, hear any further information, I'll definitely release that information to Robert and his team. You said your best preventive measure for negligence is obviously hearing the CDC guidelines, franchise guidelines, and local municipalities. Discrimination claims goes back to the right to serve. Um, such as, oh, you, you, write, you have the right to refuse service to protect others, but you don't obviously don't want to discriminate in terms of uh, uh, race, creed, color, et cetera. And one product that they do have is employment practice liability with third-party coverage endorsement. And that third-party coverage endorsement is crucial. Um, that that uh, And a lot of hotel owners have been seeing in the recent times is the uh, ADA website lawsuits. That has been uh, uh, rampant. Uh, attorneys out there and, and testers uh, looking at hotel owners' websites, uh, picking them apart for, for potential ADA suits. Um, and, and that EQI policy also protects against that with the third-party coverage, which is crucial. But that, that the third-party coverage also protects against employee lawsuits uh, with, that, with the furloughs, the layoffs, and and the, the less need for for labor, that EPI product is essential for that as well in terms of uh, uh, employees go, suing for wrongful termination, uh, retaliation claims, uh, fraudulent discrimination claims, etc. Uh, let's touch a little bit now on the insurance cycle. With the timing of the pandemic and the insurance cycle, it's very unfortunate right now we're entering what seems to be a hard market for commercial insurance, and it's more so for coastal risk uh, of properties in Florida, Louisiana, coastal Texas, coastal Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. We're seeing a lot of uh, tightening and there's a lot of carriers also holding uh, moratoriums, binding restrictions on uh, new submissions, not essentially new properties, new hotels, but new new submissions to that particular carrier or company. And, and the reason why they're, they're trying to prevent these, these uh, business income lawsuits and business income claims uh, going against their current policies or potential new policies. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more in depth on that on the potential legislation slide. Um, Weather projections from National Weather Service and hurricane centers, they're unfortunately going to be a, a fairly active year this year. So what's going to happen is we're going to have to find more markets. Uh, possibly if you're not used to using ENS carriers, access and surplus line carriers, and you're traditionally using omitted carriers, um, you may have to search those ENS carriers, surface lines carriers. Um, and there's nothing wrong with using surface lines carriers as long as they're still A rated by A Invest, which is a third party rating company. And that, that A rating is essential because a lot of lenders and again, franchise companies require that rating uh, to use that particular company. There are a few carriers hoping to enter the market uh, once the pandemic ceases, and that will open up more competition and therefore hopefully will drive the rates down. What I've been seeing is uh, each state has been pushing bills to, to force the hand of the insurance companies to uh, pay the business income claims uh, due to COVID-19 closures and civil authority. Um, right now, I haven't seen any uh, force of that being approved. Uh, each company is taking their stances. Uh, the claims are unfortunately being denied due to there's no direct damage to property uh, under special forms. And also, a lot of policies carry a uh, disease or uh, bacteria or virus exclusion. Um, but that doesn't mean that the bill may or uh, may not pass. If it does, there, I imagine there will be some uh, backlash from the insurance companies, but there hopefully there will be some reimbursements by the government entities and states themselves to, to, to lessen the blow. Because uh, it is it is widespread, this pandemic, the, the cause of the uh, economic restaurants, hotels, anything hospitality related, it's, it's, it's been um, very significant. Uh, workers' comp uh, is, is a good good example that some hoteliers can uh, save money. Um, 
Their workers' comp premium in, in most states is based on payroll, and obviously there's less less payroll being used because there's less occupancy of the property and, and, and so forth. Uh, you can contact your agent, um, your current agent or current workers' comp company, to, to endorse the current payroll uh, to a lesser amount so you can get return premium. Or some hotel owners waited to wait till the end of the policy period, and each workers' comp company will audit you. Uh, so, uh, for example, we have one hotel that. Estimate using about three hundred fifty thousand in payroll. Um, by dropping the payroll down to, to to some of the laid off employees and closures, that we were able to cut the payroll down to one hundred fifty thousand. They they received a significant amount of uh, return premium mid term um, because they did pay their policy in full. Or if you didn't pay your policy in full, you can mid term adjust it and they'll lower the the future um, installments uh, accordingly. Another good way to possibly uh, find some savings is the general liability. Uh, if you're not on a unit base, and unit base is obviously the, the room count for each property, and, and uh, those rates range from anywhere to, to 60 to $85 per room, uh, depending on your loss history and, and your crime score in that area. Uh, sales base, though, however, is based on gross sales. So if, you, if your sales took a significant hit, you can uh, possibly midterm adjust that as well. Uh, with ENS companies, uh, there is no uh, return premium on audits, so it is suggested to, to go to a midterm adjustment on that. Uh, now, if you're a mid carrier such as a State Farm, Nationwide, Travelers, there is return premium. Um, and another factor you just want to look into for the general liability sales exposure adjustment is your minimum premium. Some policies carry a minimum premium of 10000 so no matter how low you adjust the sales, there may not be a return premium, so it may be just the best to uh, leave the sales as is to avoid a potential audit swing if, if there's an uptick in, in, in sales that year or later on this year. Uh, and each policy does carry their own dif uh, differential uh, minimum and premium, minimum premiums, and so forth. So you will have to discuss that policy with your agent uh, accordingly. Uh, EPLI is an, another item that there can be uh, some savings. Uh, those are based on full-time and part-time employees, and most EPI companies rate full-time employees of uh, 30 hours or more, uh, and part-time is 30 hours or less, obviously. And with those premiums being based on employee count, you can contact your agent to adjust those accordingly uh, during this downtime. Some hotels have uh, airport shuttles or courtesy shuttles or vans, etc. What can be done for those items is contact uh, your respective auto carrier and let them know that, that the shuttle is being used a lot less frequently or possibly not being used at all. And they could put a hold on that policy. Uh, and there is a, a substantial return premiums in doing so uh, during closures or during, um, let's say you're averaging 10 trips a day with that shuttle. You cut it down to, to five trips a day or maybe one to two trips. It, I think premium credits as high as 25 to 30% on that line of business. And, and those shuttle premiums can add up if you have several uh, fleet of them for that particular property. Uh, one thing that I did not um, put on my side is, is the with the hardening of the market, there are ways to save with increases. And, and, and I, I don't recommend it, but with a hardening market, the only way to com uh, combat that is, is uh, obviously more retention, uh, more deductibles, uh, self-insurance on certain items. We're able to get uh, Florida wind deductibles are percentage deductibles. So, for example, they range from any one one percent all the way to five percent, and, and so forth. Uh, some of my one percent properties are going to two to three percent to, to to counteract some of the rate increases. And the AOP deductibles, all other perils, and most inland states have what's called all other perils deductible, and they may not even have a wind percentage deductible. All that's inclusive with the all other perils deductible. Uh, and those deductibles range anywhere from five, one thousand to, to all the way up to ten thousand, and and all the perils uh, normally stands for fire, lightning, theft, collision, collapse, um, things of that nature. And if you, for example, we had one property jump from a twenty five hundred dollar deductible to five thousand dollar deductible, we were able to get a ten percent premium credit uh, on that particular risk. A few other things that clients have been mindful of is, is insurance limits. Uh, to make sure their limits are adequate or or the possibility they're overinsured. Uh, let's say their FFE cost is, is half a million and, and there's some policies carry what's a auto inflation uh, endorsement, which is they adjust the limits 2% or 4% annually. 
and you've been on the same carrier policy for the last 10 years, and, and that, that 2%, 4% added up, and it ballooned up your rate, which may not reflect what's currently uh, on the property or exposed. Uh, one example is sign coverage. Some policies carry uh, uh, automated limits for, for sign coverage. So the limit may be automated, automatically included at about 25000 but you have a, a separate scheduled sign item, so you're essentially having duplicate coverage. Or canopies, for example, some some insureds will line item out canopies, uh, thinking it's not not co- covered if it's permanently or attached or fixed to the uh, hotel, such as carport or, or that area uh, where the lobby entrance is. That it is part of the building, so there is no, no need for a separate coverage on that on that line item. With the ducti- deductibles in mind, you got to be mindful of the the lender requirements. Some lenders may not allow you to go for a higher deductible, but Prior to changes, you may want to consult with your lender. Or your lender. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. And a lot, a lot of what you see on the screen now, I mean, it, it's it's relevant, but, but maybe never been given a lot of thought by most people on the line. Just truly a sign of unprecedented times. If there's a way to save money based on uh, the, the the what's happened in the last three months, every dollar is more valuable than it used to be. So it's good information. I'm going to leave this up for a second, and then I'll uh, we'll go to the next slide. And I'll have everybody's contact information. So thank you for your insight there. And again, these, you got a lot of people on the line who are thinking of things and then reviewing items that they've never done before. So it's good information. We appreciate it. Um, so in general, thank you all for listening in. We'll have a recording of this that we will circulate. Uh, if you have any questions or want some introductions or just you can reach out to me or directly to any of the the speakers today. And and as I said in the beginning, thank you for your time and uh, good luck with everything and have a great weekend. Thanks.